I'm Seth. I'm, I'm a consultant here at Data. And I'm Aaron. I'm Data's Chief Strategy Officer. And, and today we're going to talk about how to build an effective marketing scorecard. So these can go in a lot of different directions. So we can't tell you exactly what belongs in your scorecard, uh, but we can show you a methodology to develop one for yourself. So we, we'd love to hear any questions that you all have along the way. So feel free to drop them in the Q&A function as we go along. We'll save some time at the end to answer all your questions. And we could spend 10 more minutes up front talking about our professional credentials, experience, and the weather, but nobody likes that. So let's go. Yeah, we're not going to do that. So in order to improve anything, you need to be able to measure. And, and while adjustments to your scorecard and what you want to focus on might shift over time, it's important to at least have a few meaningful metrics that you track on a weekly, a monthly, or a quarterly basis. And, and the movement of these metrics is, is what should influence your marketing activity or, or any adjustments you need to make to your marketing plan. And the scorecard is also something that really needs to be able to be understood by an entire leadership team, not just a few marketing nerds, probably those of us in the call here today. But how do you actually build a scorecard? You know what I mean? Are you just picking some metrics off of report that you think are going to look good or, or metrics that you think are going to make you look good? We've never really seen a great framework for how to land on meaningful metrics. So we, we, we took what we've learned from working with hundreds of businesses and we developed a system. First, you need to figure out your specific objectives. And this one goes way beyond marketing. Uh, next, you have to know your end of day success metrics. And that measurables to feed those success metrics. And finally, and this one is kind of a bonus, you have to plot out your activity around your early indicators of success. All right. So Seth, did you know that marketing is actually optional? Looks like Seth is... Oh, we might be having a few technical difficulties. So marketing, technically optional. It's not like accounting or HR or a bunch of other boring business functions that you absolutely have to have in order to be legally compliant. You can go without marketing as long as you have no competitors and everyone knows who you are and everyone needs what you're selling. Since that's not the case for pretty much anyone other than your high-speed internet provider, most of us have specific things that we are hoping marketing will help us do. And spelling out those things is absolutely critical because marketing is a field with a lot of shiny objects that can take focus away from what actually matters. And without specific objectives that your full team is brought in on, you're really going to be prone to distraction and one-off efforts that don't really actually build towards success or towards goals. In order to give your marketing focus, we actually want to start one layer above marketing. What is your business trying to do? So marketing can and absolutely should be an enabling factor for many, if not most, of your business goals. That could look like helping you recruit and retain talent. That could be helping increase recurring revenue. That could even be revamping your product or service offerings. Today, we're going to take a pretty simple and common example, which is that our pretend business wants to grow revenue. We see this one a lot. Almost everyone wants to grow revenue. Unfortunately, we also see that a lot of companies just kind of slap a percentage next to that and call it a day. All right, we want to grow revenue 20%. Let's go. We're going to dig deeper. How are we going to grow revenue? Well, probably some of that will come from new logos that we add to our list of customers. And some of that will also come from growing our existing customers. All right, let's slap a percentage on each of those and set the sales guys loose. So I can just go out and find any customer I want. I'm just going to go to Florida and Target golf club manufacturers and wait 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 there's more there's more okay so when we say get new customers where are we getting them from as you can see seth needs some guidance are we going to go in and open up whole new markets or are we going to gain market share in a market that we're already in if we open up a new market are we going to look for a market we can go after with our product the way it is today or do we need to evolve our offering to fit a new market that we want to pursue if instead we're looking at gaining more share in our existing market, are we going to get those additional customers? Are we going to steal them from a competitor in the market with us? Or are we going to actually increase the total size of the market? Okay, well, how about growing our current customers? That might be a little simpler. Are we just going to sell them more of what we sold them? Maybe getting them to a higher level of service or just having them order more from us? Or are we wanting to sell them something different in addition, a complimentary offering to something that they've already purchased or are already purchasing from us? We have a ton of options once we start peeling this back. 
But narrowing down is especially critical because for most of us, we only have the capacity to do some of these things. If you're Procter & Gamble, you can do, and they do all of these things at once. If you're on this webinar, you probably don't have hundreds of marketers at your command. You probably have significantly fewer resources available to you. So you really have to prioritize the best bang for the buck. Here's our simplified and far more specific top-level business goals that pertain to marketing. Here's what we want to do, and here's the specifics of how we're going to achieve it. And when you repeat this exercise for yourself, you might have more goals. You'll almost certainly have different goals. And it's probably going to take some team arm wrestling to get the team to all buy in on what this should look like. Today, we're focusing on how you pull those layers back. Great. So next, we need to look at what it looks like to win. It, these are your key success metrics. And they tell you at the end of the day, if what you're looking at is success or if it's failure. Oftentimes when asked if something is working, we tend to look at the end results. You know, is it working? Are we getting new sales? If we are, something's working. Are we seeing customer growth? If it's not, something's not working and so on. We have to measure these, is it working metrics? But we also have to understand that these are what we call lagging indicators. By the time you see trouble here, it's already too late to do a whole lot about it because they're the very last metrics that show up in the cycle. In our example here, we're going to look at our two objectives individually. Uh, new customer sales into a specific new market. So what's going to tell us uh, if, if that's working? It, it might be as simple as new sales or, or new logos in the new market. Or it might be tied to a dollar figure, like, like new MMR from our new market. And on the existing customer growth side, the, like the farming side, you might look at changes in revenue growth average per customer. Or, or maybe there's a service tier you're pushing your customers towards and your success metric might be the percentage of customers who are on that top service tier. And both are probably accomplishing the same thing, but for the sake of simplicity, it makes sense uh, for us to use maybe one or two metrics for your scorecard. So just like we did with your marketing objectives, we prioritize. So in this case, we're going to look specifically at new logos in your new market and the percent of customers on that top service tier. If we can show improvement to both of these success metrics, we're going to be winning. But it's important to consider, again, that these are lagging indicators. They don't tell you if you're going to be successful. They tell you after the fact. So if you want to get smart about your approach, you have to look upstream. Lagging indicators are usually relatively easy to figure out, whereas leading indicators can be both hard to decide on and difficult to actually get to. But you absolutely need them. Otherwise, it's kind of like making sure you're not speeding by checking what time you got to your destination. By the time you have the data, it's too late to change speed. Let's dig into how we can figure out some leading indicators to help clock our speed in real time. We decided on new logos in a new market and percentage of customers in the top service tier as our lagging indicators of success that should pretty much correlate to how well we hit our overall goal. What comes before those? Before we have fruit, we have flowers. Or rather, before we get new customers, we have qualified leads in a pipeline. That's better, but it's still laggy. One layer up from that could be new leads from our website or new sales engagements in the new market. And one layer up from new leads and new sales engagement probably looks a lot like this. Marketing outcomes like ad traffic quality and quantity, organic search volume, or even visits to a shiny new industry page that we built. We're essentially climbing back on a cause and effect ladder to figure out what's a likely predictor of our downstream goals. What about on current customer opportunities? Well, before we get a new opportunity from an existing customer, we're probably engaging with those existing customers in some way. One layer up from that, we're going to be doing our best to gauge how they're interacting with our marketing and promotional activity, or even with our account management staff. And we could track all of these things. But again, due to resources and focus, we're going to want to prioritize. So I'm going to get on a soapbox for a minute here. Marketing these days comes with a lot of metrics. Every single platform out there is excited to give you your own dashboard filled with neat data visualizations about what a wonderful ROI they're providing you. And every marketer out there knows that the numbers you pick can tell a great story or a sad story. 
and way too many marketers and advertisers and SEO specialists and AI snake oil salespeople like to put as many numbers in front of you as possible to make it too complex for you to detangle while still looking extremely important. And every single one of us looks at all those numbers and thinks, gosh, I have no clue if this is actually good or bad because there's no context here. That's why a scorecard is important. It's literally built from context. You pick the numbers that matter in a logical, thoughtful way. You learn what good or bad looks like over time based on your own data and learnings. That doesn't mean we never look at other numbers and that other numbers aren't important. If your authority score is dropping like a rock and you suddenly have 10 times the amount of likes on all your LinkedIn posts, those are things to investigate. But with the scorecard, we're on the driver's seat. We set it up, we stick to it. We've got a pretty good outline now for what a scorecard could look like. We have our high-level goals. We have two lagging indicators that are directly correlated to those high-level goals. And we've got a thoughtful, decent handful of leaning indicators that should predict the laggards. Now, our first quarter or so with this, we're absolutely going to be making educated guesses about what the relationships and ratios between lagging and leading look like. But it's a logical and defendable start. Now, we can look at how we drive the numbers here. Okay. So the, the next thing we need to do is put action behind our scorecard. And if you don't have any marketing activity running right now, this is a great way to plan what you need to do to push those leading and lagging indicators. If you are actively marketing right now, this is a really good gut check. Are, are my activities making a meaningful impact toward our business objectives or do I need to make a change? And actually, it's, it's like starting with activity and picking out what you want to measure is backwards logic. It almost makes more sense to start with what you want to produce and then build out your activity that way. So let's take a look at what this, what this could look like. Well, I'm, I'm not going to go through each individual sales and marketing activity in this particular example, but you can see how every action we're taking directly impacts our leading indicators, which in turn impact our lagging indicators, which then contribute to our overall goals. And, and actually, while we build our scorecards starting with objectives that lead to activity, our arrows are actually pointing the other way. Upstream metrics and actions are what impact the end result. So just one example, your activity might be to build out a robust page on your website that's specific to your new market, okay? And that's going to contribute to your website industry page visits, which feeds your marketing qualified leads, which feeds your sales qualified leads, and a percentage of those leads are going to turn into new logos and new markets. Or as another example, creating an effective email sequence campaign to existing customers. It might feed your open rate, which feeds your customer engagements, which feeds your current customer opportunities. And a percentage of those are going to lead to upsells, which leads to a higher percentage of customers at your top services tier. So while, while some of this seems kind of simple, this is a way more effective way to determine activity than setting up a email sequencing because Adam in sales said that email marketing worked really good for his cousin. You know, like it takes away any issues uh, in, in clarity over what any activity is trying to accomplish. And among other things, this logic-based approach is a really solid way to get sales and marketing on the same page. We moved through that pretty quickly, so I'm going to take it all the way back to the framework. First, you want to lock in on specific business objectives that you want your marketing to address. Then you want to determine what are the end-of-day success metrics, the lagging indicators that are going to say, yes, we accomplished this, or no, we fell short. After that. You want to figure out what metrics point to success in those indicators. What are the leading indicators of that? And then you plot your activity around what impacts those leading indicators. What we really wanted you to take away from this webinar was a logical, methodical approach to crafting your own marketing scorecard. And we want that to, to help focus and drive your overall marketing plan. If, if you're going to need more support in developing your scorecard and implementing your marketing plan, that's something data can help with. Uh, some of you here today are going through or have recently been through this process, we want to help you build a logical scorecard. And that begins in some of our earliest conversations. Like all of our engagements start with an introduction. Then we bring a consultant for a 90-minute assessment session. Uh, we'll, we'll present the plan and timeline that shows you what you need to implement and when. And if a partnership makes sense, we move forward and develop out your strategy and plan. If not, you walk away with a lot of great actionable ideas. Like our goal is always to lead with value. So with that, I want to turn it over 
to you all. Either use the QA function or raise your hand. Uh, we love to hear what you're measuring today, what's on your scorecard today. And if this presentation triggered any new thoughts or ideas for what you maybe should be uh, measuring in the future. So yeah, I want to open it to you all. What, what questions do you have? Does anyone have a marketing scorecard today? You can raise your hand and talk. All right, we did get one question here. So Anna asks, our organization has marketing activities that we need to keep doing, but I don't think they fall into what you're laying out here in terms of leading up to our main goals. If they're not on our scorecard, but are still important to track, what does that look like? For example, how do reviews fit into a scorecard? Should these additional marketing activities even fit into a scorecard to begin with? So I'll click answer live on that one. And Seth, maybe I'll start and then you'll add on to it. Yeah, why don't you go ahead with this one? Okay. So reviews absolutely could fit onto a scorecard. It depends on what your top level goals are. So to use an example we didn't use today, if one of my goals is to help recruit new employees and marketing needs to help HR in that aspect, which it absolutely does, employee reviews are probably actually going to be a critical part of my scorecard. So almost any metric could end up on a scorecard. But you're right that sometimes, you know, a scorecard is very narrow. I think the purpose of a scorecard is really to engage high level discussion. So that could be executive C suite discussion, it could be board level discussion. But a scorecard is essentially a one sheeter that you look at on a pretty re regular interval that everybody understands how those drive goals. But there's a lot of marketing stuff that is important that you need to keep an eye on if you're a marketing director or a CMO that doesn't belong on the scorecard. So for example, here at Data, we have different report levels that we report on regularly. We have monthly reports, which look at things that are likely to fluctuate month to month. We have quarterly reports, which are more in depth and take a bigger picture view of more things. And then we also have marketing scorecards, which are much more simplified views of that. And if I was a marketing director, which I guess I actually am, I would not be taking my quarterly report into an executive meeting and explaining to them why page visits to this particular page dropped in Q3. I would be taking a marketing scorecard to them because that's what we've agreed on is important at that level of discussion. So it's about really narrowing focus in for the high level discussion that doesn't eliminate the need for you to understand the metrics across the board for your business. So Seth, what would you add to that? Yeah, I think just echoing, I think scorecard is C-level board members, overall contributions to the overall strategy. And then there's also marketing reporting and analysis, which is really important at the more granular level that, you know, maybe marketing professionals would spend more time in. I'll add on to that. It's when you are in that marketing seat presenting to, let's say you're in a nonprofit situation, you're actually presenting to a board, it's even more important to get that buy-in up front about what's important. Because if you do bring the whole presentation to someone who's not in the day-to-day -day of marketing, guaranteed you will go down little rabbit holes that you don't want to be explaining to the board that don't really have an impact on what they need to be thinking of. So it's as a marketing leader, it's your ability to steer conversations that's important with this as well. Great question, though. Anything else? Or any horror stories? I always like those. Yeah. Have you ever measured the wrong thing? I want to know who's actually measuring the different emotions they get in Facebook reactions. Who's measuring the angries as part of their scorecard? And reporting it to, and reporting it to the board. News organizations, that's who. Yeah. All right. Well... I think we are done for today. Thank you all so much for joining us. I hope this was useful and we will send up. Oh, wait, got one more. We are a small company and don't have a big marketing team. We're growing, but how do I get this started? That is a very broad question. So small company, don't have a big marketing team. That's where narrowing focus is going to be really important for you. You should have high level goals as a business. Um, the more specific those high-level goals can be, the happier your life will be because that will enable you to get, have that focus. Um, so the exercise we went through, I'm assuming growth is a big part of it, um, narrowing down where you're likely to see that growth 
is going to be really critical and really hard. What you see with smaller businesses, especially, especially if you're a new business, is that you just may not know enough to know which direction to go at first. You have to make an educated guess and start there. So you want to say, okay, we want to grow customers, hypothetically. We think, given our resources and where we've seen success so far, that we should start trying to grow customers in these directions. And then you brainstorm what are all the ways marketing could contribute to that. And then one of the filters you're going to use to narrow those goals down is what's actually feasible within the budget and resources I have today. So it's a little bit of a back and forth when you're really dealing with a small scope and maybe dealing with not a ton of prior knowledge if you're a startup, which I don't know that, but I'm making some assumptions. So really starts by having a very intentional discussion at the leadership level where you acknowledge, hey, limits are a big part of this for us. Yeah. What do you think, Seth? Yeah, and I'd say the, the first step, you know, how do I get this started? You don't need to have marketing expertise. You don't need to be a marketer to get this started. You know, it's what I put up on the screen here is, is similar to what Aaron was talking through, really. It's where do you have opportunities and where do you need to set your focus? And once you, and the hard part really is going to be prioritizing. Once you prioritized it, you know, then you, then you build off of that and go, how am I going to get there? So, I mean, this system is designed to help you go from large conceptual to activity. Yeah. Yeah, just back on one of those examples. So like new customer sales into a new market, limits are going to be really critical there. You probably don't have the resources to revamp your entire product or service offering to enter a new market. If you're going to break into a new market by necessity, it's going to be a, a market that's very similar to the one you're currently in or one that only takes small tweaks from it. So you're going to spend the most time on this top stage. The good news is once you have this in place, it will help you guide those rabbit hole conversations that tend to happen where people are like, well, why are we more active on Instagram? And you can say, hey, because I'm one person and you're having me wear 15 hats and we agree on these goals. So it's a little more difficult at a small size, but I would say it's even more critical because you just don't have the resources to be everywhere at once. But thank yeah. you. Great question. Yeah. The logic here is also when I think of somebody in that type of position, it's, I'll go back to something you said earlier, Aaron, which is the shiny objects. Mm -hmm. They're all, it's really easy to get pulled into shiny objects. And when you lay out a logical flow like this, it's a really good way to avoid the shiny objects. Right. Thank you so much. Great. With that, I think we'll let everyone have a few minutes back in their day. We will send out this recording. So look for that in your next data newsletter. Thank you for joining us today. I hope it was useful.